This is a resource of Just Loving God. Ephesians part 7, from chapter 1, verse 6a. All for God's glory. We're carrying on in our series in Ephesians chapter 1. If you'd like to turn to Ephesians 1, verse 6. Actually, we're going to start from verse 3 and just read up to it. And my aim is that you begin to comprehend what has happened to you in Christ. Your election, your selection by God to be holy, to be blameless. Your predestination to be adopted like the firstborn son and heir of God. So that you fall in wonder and praise before his glory. Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace. Have you ever wondered what the purpose of all creation is? You wondered why God did all that he's done? We see it here in this little phrase, to the praise of the glory of his grace. Many translations, I think, weaken this by merely saying, to the praise of his glorious grace. And it is glorious. His grace is glorious. But it's different to say to the praise of the glory of his grace. I'm with Martin Lloyd-Jones and the King James Version and the NASB and the NAB and the World English Bible and Young's literal translation on this. I think it is better to say to the praise of the glory of his grace. You know, everything is about the glory of God, the glory of the Father. The great motive behind redemption is the glory of God. It's to see God glorified. It's to see the Father lifted high. It's to see the Son lifted high and the Holy Spirit lifted high. It's not so that your life could be made better. That isn't the purpose of redemption. It's not because you were just so special. God was just moved to save you because there was something in you that just attracted him. No. It's for his glory. It's all for his glory. It all originated in him. It was motivated by God's will to glorify himself. And we see verses 3, 4, 5, and 6 of this chapter are all talking about the Father. What's the Father de- decided? What's he decreed? What's he put into, into motion? What's he done through his Son? How has he decreed that you should be this? And how has he decreed that you should be adopted as a son? It's all about the Father, these verses. All glory be to his name. So if we tie all these verses together, just look what he's done for you. Just try, if you can, to wrap your mind around what he has done for you. Ask him for spiritual revelation because I tell you, it's too big. He's chosen you. He's elected you. He's selected you before the universe was made. Just think about that. To be holy like he is. You'll never be God, but you're going to be like God in the state of holiness, the state of blamelessness, so that nothing could be said that could possibly condemn or criticize or pull down or point to a flaw in you. Nothing. Can you imagine that? Then he's predestined. That means he's foreordained. He's decided ahead of time to adopt you as a child. Adopt you. He didn't have to do that. He could have just saved you. He could have just forgiven you, but he didn't have to make you a child. And you get all that that entails. All the fatherly love and protection and provision and relationship and discipline and, of course, the inheritance. And you will forever inherit. You will forever be in his presence. Just try and get your head around all of this, what he has decided to do in you. Your salvation actually glorifies God. John 17, Jesus is praying this last great prayer of his before he was crucified. And he said in verse 10, 
to his father, all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And then through your instrumentality in the salvation of others, your telling of this good news to others, he's also glorified, just as Jesus prayed for those who will believe through their word. We've believed through the word of others, and others will believe through our word. Jesus prays for those who will believe, and he's glorified in that. We must continuously tell the good news for God's glory. So to the praise of the glory, we just stop there, to the praise of the glory, it's his glory that is demonstrated by and manifested in and exemplified through grace. It's his glory that is center stage. Not even the grace, it's his glory. Doing all this in us and through us and for us, it's his glory to which praise is directed. It's his glory that's exalted in all of this. For you to know and understand what the purpose of God in the creation of everything is, and then to align your life with that purpose is everything. If you're fighting with a different purpose than the purpose God has, you're in deep trouble. You can't fight him. Align your life to his purpose. It's glorious. Then you'll have joy. Then you'll have peace. Then you'll have the love that you've longed for for so long, the glory and the rest. You'll have the fulfillment. And yes, dare I say it, happiness. It's God's kind of happiness. Very different than the world's. Here is his purpose for creation. Isaiah 43, verse 6. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name and whom I have created for my glory, whom I have formed, even whom I have made. Do you see? It's for his glory. That's why you were made. Man was made in God's image. Why? So that he could reflect the glory of God. It's not to make God more glorious. This reflected glory can't improve some flaw in God. Oh, goodness, no. It's rather to display his glory. Isaiah 43, verse 21 goes on. It says, the people whom I formed for myself, that they might declare my praise. Isaiah 44, next chapter, verse 23. The Lord has redeemed Jacob and will be glorified in Israel. This is the purpose. If you could just see that and align yourself with this. Isaiah 48, verse 9. For my name's sake, I defer my anger. For the sake of my praise, I restrain it for you, that I may not cut you off. Behold, I have refined you, but not like silver. I have tried you in the furnace of affliction. For my own sake, for my own sake, I do it. For how should my name be profaned? My glory, I will not give to another. And then that wonderful passage in Ezekiel chapter 36 that speaks of the new covenant, the glorious promises of this new relationship with God where God himself comes to inhabit us. But bookending these great promises are some amazing verses. Ezekiel 36 verse 21, I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations where they went. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you went. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when I prove myself holy among you in their sight. For I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the lands and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, etc., etc. The beautiful promises of the new covenant then follow. And then he bookends it at the other end. In verse, sorry, in verse 32, he says, I am not doing this for your sake, declares the Lord God. Let that be known to you. 
Oh, how many have profaned his name. How many have gone out into the world, into the nations, and profaned the name of the Lord? Well, he says, I will not have my name profaned. I will sprinkle you with clean water. You say, that's not possible. I've done too much. I've gone too far. Not true. You don't know the mercy and the grace of God, if that's what you say. In the second Thessalonians chapter one, verse 10, Paul again says this, Christ will return to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at by all who believe. This is the purpose. This is why we were made. This is why he's redeemed you. This is why he's calling you into salvation. The aim of God in releasing you from sin's prison and adopting you is praise for each member of the Trinity. We see this in Ephesians chapter one. Our text, verses six, or verses five and six, relate to the Father. It says, he predestined us in love to be his sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace. And then in verse 12, it's talking about Jesus Christ. We who first hoped in Christ have been predestined and appointed to life for the praise of his glory. There it is again. The praise of Christ's glory there. And then in verse 14, it's talking about the Holy Spirit's glory. The Holy Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So we praise the Father, we praise the Son, we praise the Holy Spirit for this glorious glory that he's bestowed upon us. From eternity to eternity, this has been God's plan. It was formed in his mind. He came up with this plan that his glory would be magnified and praised. And in particular, the glory of his grace. John 17, again, verse five, Jesus says this, and now father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. And in verse 24, father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. But some people struggle with this. I'll deal with this briefly. Some people say, well, aren't we not meant to seek our own glory? Why is God seeking his own glory? It just feels a little bit strange. Well, let me help you understand, I hope. God's self-glorification has to be understood. It is love in action that he glorify himself. It is perfection, it is absolute rightness that he glorify rightness, that he glorify perfection. It is absolutely essential. People, you see, live for approval. They live for glorification. They live, they need self-worth. They need it. They need to feel that they are good. They're fundamentally, though, selfish in that. We're incapable of seeking any comp compliments even for ourselves without some mixture of pride or some flaw in our character. But not so with our great God. He isn't like that. He doesn't need anything. He has no needs. He is love. To exalt himself and to love us and to seek our welfare are inseparable in God. Let me say that again. To exalt himself and to love us and to seek our welfare are inseparable in God. A failure to seek his own glory would drop us out of the equation. I'll explain. To give us the absolute best is to give us his presence, is to give us a vision of his glory, is to give us the ability to worship him in spirit and in truth is to be able to give us the ability to bow down before him and give him homage. That is our best. That's the greatest thing he could give us. This bowing always leads to praise, and this is for our good. We creatures always flow into praising what we enjoy the most, don't we? If we've read a good book or watched a good film, or we want to tell someone how wonderful our spouse is, or girlfriend or boyfriend, or 
some landscape that we've seen or some piece of art, we just instinctively have to talk about it. We instinctively have to say something good about it. It's an essential element of our enjoyment to be able to say what we think about it. In fact, being denied the ability to say something about what we are so passionate about is almost torture. So for God to be 100% loving, he must draw us and enable us to express worship to the person that we most enjoy, himself. No other being can express true love by seeking his own perfect, right, and wholesome worship. Nothing but humble adoration and worship of the one we enjoy most can satisfy our deepest cravings in turn, eternally. Nothing else can do that. So the purpose of all creation is to glorify God because that shows his love for creation. But what is this glory? It says to the praise of the glory of his grace. What is this glory? John Wesley put it this way. He said the glory of God, strictly speaking, is his glorious essence and his attributes, which have been ever of old and this glory admits of no increase being the same yesterday, today, and forever. John Piper puts it this way, God's glory is the perfect harmony of all his attributes into one infinitely beautiful and personal being. So what is this glory? If I could truly express what this glory is, I don't think any of us would be able to stand because it would be an actual experience of his glory, if that were possible for a human to express. But I'll do my best. It is beauty. It is light. It is purity. It is holiness. It is awesome power. It's his awesome presence. It's eternity. It is splendor. It's his great name, Yahweh. It is his face. It's God's goodness. This is the same goodness that passed in front of Moses, you may remember. In Exodus 33, Moses said, please show me your glory. And God said in verse 19, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord, Yahweh. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Verse 22, God goes on, while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Anyone who sees the face of God in the flesh will die. How can you express the glory of God? It's impossible to describe. And God is even clothed in glory. Psalm 104 verse one says, bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. How else could I possibly describe this glory? It's, it's iridescent, it's pearlescent, it's radiant, it's shining, it's overwhelmingly bright, it's light, it's heat, it's searching, it's revealing, it's seeing through the core of every child, of every woman, of every man. It's like a divine x-ray that sees all things. There is no rock or cave or hole or the depths of outer space where you could hide from this glory. First John 1 verse 5 says, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Hebrews 1 verse 3 says, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. How can we wrap our minds around this? The sheer reverence, the sheer silence of the soul when in the presence of God, mute before majesty. Let every hand be placed over every mouth before his imperial splendor. Some of you will have been with us when we've 
sometimes sung and worshipped and given glory to God. And there has descended upon us a, a holy silence that I can only describe as awe-striking. I can only describe as holy, fearful, awe-inspiring, wondrous. It puts a shudder through the depths of a man with a holy fear and a holy reverence and a holy love for God. And this glory could also be described as the Shekinah, the Shekinah glory, as it's sometimes called. In the Bible, it talks about a visible manifestation of God's presence. This word Shekinah is a Hebrew word, and it means he caused to dwell or he settled. And it refers to the presence of God just coming and dwelling with men, settling in a place. It's not found in scripture, this word, so we have to use it judiciously. But the concept is absolutely in scripture. It's first found in rabbinic literature, and they used it to refer to the presence of God. So I think we could use this term, maybe, to, de to describe the indescribable. From the fiery, cloudy pillar that led the Israelites through the desert, all the way through to Jesus himself. In Colossians 2.9, it says, In Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. But so few saw it. That's why Jesus said to Philip, Anyone who's seen me has seen the Father. No one can see his face and live. But soon you will see the face of the Trinity in all the glory of God. You will see him as he is, John says. This is the same glory that Jude was talking about in his verse 24. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. The presence of his glory. I hope you're getting a, a tiny, tiny idea what that could even be like. The presence of his glory and to be able to stand there blameless? How is this? Such splendor, such beauty. I desire to see his glory deeply, continuously. I don't wanna any longer see things imperfectly like puzzling reflections in a mirror because then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete, but then I will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. Have you longed for his appearing? Have you longed to see that face that sees right through you? Sees everything you are, everything you've ever done, that makes everything visible, everything dark brought to the light, everything hidden brought out to be shouted from the rooftop. Have you longed to see that face? I have. Why? Because I'm hidden in Christ. And if you're not, you must be. You must be. But some will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. God is omnipresent, but I tell you, there's a place where his presence is not as his children will experience it. Turn to God today, if that's you. Anyone under the sound of my voice, I beseech you, repent of your wickedness. Turn away from your wickedness. He will receive you. He promises to receive you. Turn, believe upon him. He has done a work for you that will eternally shelter you in the refuge of Christ. You can. Be whole. You can be saved. So be like Moses. Seek to see the glory of God. Ask him. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Did you ever read that like that? You shall see God if you're pure in heart. Cry out for his character inside you. How can a man or a woman be pure? Oh, only by partaking of the divine nature. 
We must have his character growing in us or we have no purity at all. Cry out for his holiness. Cry out for cleanliness, cleanness of soul, cleanness of mind. Cry out to him for it. Seek him daily that he might change you so that you might see God. Even let me see the back of God like Moses, this most infinitely beautiful, holy and personal being. So when Ephesians 1, 6 says, to the praise of his glory, I think it means to the praise of God himself. I don't think it means to the praise of the grace, wonderful as that is. I think it means to the praise of him. Paul saying, all that I've just written, all that I've tried to express here in this first little section, and all that you've begun to understand naturally leads to you enjoying God forever. And thus, out of you flowing praise to him, worship, adoration, admiration, love. And here's my next point. When you see salvation in scripture, as we do here in Ephesians chapter one, we always see the glory there too. They always go together. This is why grace is glory filled. This is why to just say the glorious grace, I think slightly weakens it. It's the glory of the grace. It's the glory that infuses the grace. Ephesians 1 is describing our salvation and the grace of God. You notice they're together, all for his glory. Salvation and new birth are all through the power of the Holy Spirit, who is glorious. The Holy Spirit of God is like nothing else. You could say it's like the wind, using human terms as Jesus did. Poor old Nicodemus didn't understand. In John chapter three, he's trying to explain to this Pharisee, listen, this new birth I'm talking about is by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. No less. Your salvation is universe shattering. But the Holy Spirit, I think, has been dumbed down today so much. And maybe it's understandable because people were trying to get people to expect the moving of the Spirit, to connect somehow with the reality that the Holy Spirit does still move. But I think we have to be so careful to leave the reverence of the glory of God. This is a staggering truth that if you like the Shekinah glory now dwells in earthen vessels. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. How can we boast before this? We're just an earthenware pot, a, a reject at that, malformed, missing handle, cracked and chipped. But inside dwells this glory of God himself. But we will see this glory soon. We will be seen for who we have been made soon. Romans chapter 8 verse 18 says, Our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. It's his glory in us. This is staggering, this truth. You're so familiar with the grace of God. Even if you don't know God, I tell you, you're so familiar with the goodness of God to let the wind blow on your cheek, to let you love a child, to let you enjoy food, to even keep living, that you have no idea how staggering this is. This salvation is glorious. It's extraordinary. Salvation is all for God's glory. That's why we've been saved. Salvation is caused by God's glory being present. It can't happen unless his presence is there. Salvation could be accomplished by nothing less than God's glory. Salvation takes the very presence and the power of the glory of God. This takes the greatest power in the universe to save a man's soul. This is why grace is glorious. It's glorious. It's full of glory, this grace. It's full of God, this grace. It's saturated in God's glory. It's saturated in the presence of God. It's infused with God's very essence. 
with his might, with his beauty, with his splendor. It's far more than just amazing grace. Oh, amazing it is. But it's more than just amazing grace. It's more than just wonderful grace. It's the very glory of God manifested in this unmerited kindness. That's the key. That's the center of it. That's the heart of it. It's all about him. The glory of God always attends grace. This is sublime. It, it, it is to be exalted, this glory, because it's him. In John 1 verse 14, it says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Salvation being dumbed down means that this glory is diminished. It means that the glory of God is concealed or pushed away. We can't dumb down salvation. We can't speak of this as a light thing or just a, a man-made thing. It's not by the will of flesh or by the will of man that someone is born from above. This decisionism is so dangerous. This saying, well, yeah, I just said an incantation and I'm going to heaven because that's it. I said the right words. It's so dangerous. It so diminishes the glory of God. There is, of course, a general call to repentance for all children, all women, all men. All men are called to repent without exception. The call is out. So in some sense, grace is present for every man, woman and child to just take it. And, and the, the violent, it says, Jesus said that the violent take it by force, the forceful seize the kingdom of heaven but we also know that no one can come to him without the father drawing them we also know that jesus said you didn't choose me i chose you the cloud has to move before you can up tent stakes and go the shekinah cloud of glory must descend on the tabernacle the heavens must be rent torn in half so that god may come down to a man this is not the work of flesh. This is the work of the Spirit of God. And also we are in danger when we start thinking this as benefits salvation. What's in it for me? Many Christians err on the side of exalting man's part in salvation. And I think that puts them in danger. If I err at all, I err on the side of God's greatness in salvation. God's work, God's sovereignty in salvation. I err that way. Why? Because I know what's in me. I know how I would be tempted to be proud or boast that somehow I somehow helped God. Where is the glory of God gone in this great subject of salvation? The glory of God always attends grace. The creation, the heavens declare the glory of the Lord. That's why sinners are without excuse. They say, oh, I don't believe there is a God. Doesn't matter. You've seen what he's made. You've seen these these beautiful things in creation that manifest his divine nature and eternal power. You've seen. You have no excuse. It's too late. It doesn't matter what you say. You've seen. And also grace and glory have always been together through history. If we look through the Bible, right from the Garden of Eden, we see it. The very first gospel message uttered was by God himself. The glory of God descended into that garden and spoke to that serpent and spoke to Eve and spoke to Adam. Genesis 3.15, here's what God said. This is the gospel. I will put enmity between you, snake, and the woman. And between your offspring and hers, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. This is what we call the proto-evangelium, the first gospel. The very first gospel, it introduces two completely unknown concepts into this garden. The curse on mankind because of Adam's sin and God's provision of a savior who would take on this curse upon himself. This is the gospel. You see here grace and you see glory. You see glory proclaiming grace, do you see? They never apart. We go through the Old Testament, look at Abraham. In Acts chapter 7, verse 3, Stephen, who was just about to be stoned to death, he says this, Brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran. The glory of God appeared to Abraham. And he 
gave him grace. You see, the glory again accompanied the grace that called Abraham out. It's always together. Look at Moses. He saw the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire, shielding, leading, protecting. Then on Sinai's mountain, he saw the thunder and the lightning of the glory of God. Then he saw the glory cloud come down on the tabernacle. And there, the glory of God dwelt between the cherubim. Oh, glory and grace met together right there. The glory of God on the mercy seat, the seat of propitiation, that seat where the blood was sprinkled. Glory and grace married. Isaiah would later cry in Isaiah 37, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, that dwells between the cherubim, you are the God, even you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. You've made heaven and earth. And then we wheel forward to Solomon, and we see that he just completed building the temple, and he honored God and brought the ark back into the temple. 2 Chronicles 5, verse 14. The priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. It's biblical not to be able to stand in God's presence. I don't mean falling around and behaving like a fool. I mean when the glory of God comes. We prayed with a man two weekends ago. He couldn't even stand up off his chair. He was quivering like a leaf. The glory of God hit him, changed his life, changed his marriage, changed his family. God did it. That's the glory of God. Then we go forward to Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Let me tell you, you're made of earth. Your earth has got to be filled with the glory of God. It has to be. Otherwise, you'll never stand before his glory in that day. You can't. You can't. You must be filled with the glory. Then we wheel forward to Ezekiel. Chapter 1, verse 26. Above the vault, over their heads, was what looked like a throne of lapis lazuli. And high above on the throne was a figure like that of a man. I saw that from what appeared to be his waist up, he looked like glowing metal, as if full of fire. And that from there down, he looked like fire. And brilliant light surrounded him. Like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day, so was the radiance around him. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. When I saw it, I fell face down, and I heard the voice of one speaking. Oh, there is nothing like the glory of God. I tell you, when I hear someone say, I took a selfie because the, the Shekinah glory came down into our church building, oh, I tell you, I shake with fear. How little you know of the glory of God. Fool, how dare you mock him? You wouldn't be able to stand if he came into the room in that way. And then look at dear old Asaph, Psalm 73. He says, he went into the sanctuary of God and it was only there sitting in the presence of God's glorious life that he had any understanding of the fate of the wicked. He had to be in the presence of the glory of God to understand anything. And then we come into the New Testament. Look at the birth of Christ. Luke 2, verse 9, an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. John 1, verse 14, again, we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, in another translation. 2 Peter 1, verse 16, Peter's talking about the transfiguration of Christ on the mountain. We did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power. 
but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And the glory of God was also revealed, this wondrous glory through the miracles that Jesus did and still does. John 2 verse 11, the first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him the effect should always be the same should always be the same i'll tell you when god in his grace lets us feel the tangible presence of his glory when his word smites our soul so hammer-like that we know he's speaking to us right now i tell you it has the same effect there's a godly reverence and fear that comes upon the soul there is a believing that comes into the soul. There is an acknowledgement of my lack, my inadequacy before the great holiness of God. Peter, he fell down at Jesus' knee saying, depart from me for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. What had happened? Just caught some fish. Really? That's not just what happened. He saw the glory. It's like Isaiah said back in verse five of his chapter six, woe is me. For I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. It's just like the ascension of Christ. This revealed the glory. All those dear women that were there, the men had run. These precious women were there. They were there from the beginning. They were there when he died, and they were there when he rose. Joanna, Susanna, the Marys, they were at the tomb. They saw the glory of God revealed. It's no wonder Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Salvation is knowing the glory of God. That is knowing God and his son. This is salvation. This is eternal life. To actually know God. To actually know God, you must have encountered his glory. You must have bowed your knees and bowed your heart before him. He's wonderful. He's magnificent. He's holy. He's good. He is just and he's gracious. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. And ultimately, grace reveals the glory. Grace reveals the presence of God. Grace reveals the very essence of God. It points us to the glorious one. It's not the grace we worship. It's the one who gave the grace. The glory of God revealed in the very face of Jesus Christ. Your salvation allows you to see God's glory pouring into your heart, pouring into your life. It's in Christ, it's in his work, it's in his kindness, it's in his mercy. This is where we see the glory of God. And then, wonder of wonders. The glory of God is revealed through you and through me, through God's ecclesia, his group of called out humans. This thing we call the church. Ephesians 3.10, I'm reading from the NLT. God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was his eternal plan, which he carried out through Christ Jesus our Lord. Oh, his glory is revealed through us, the body of Christ. What wonder is this? What extraordinary work is this? What glory is this? So how can we utter enough praise to God? How could we not praise the glory? Because the glory is him, the glorious one. He who is the majestic glory. To the praise of the glory. Do you see that differently now? I hope to the praise of the glory that makes grace even grace. Without the glorious one, grace isn't grace. 
His selecting of his precious ones, his foreordaining, their adoption before the creation of the universe. This all leads to one thing, praise. It all leads to the praise of the glory of his grace. Do you realize who it is who has given you the grace? It's very easy to sing about the grace, the grace, the grace, the grace. And yes, we feel grateful and yes, it's wonderful. But sometimes we forget the giver. We forget the glorious one. That, I think, is what Paul's trying to say here. I think he's turning our attention back up to the glory of God. One so awe-inspiring, so majestic, so illumined, so bright, so good, so kind, so merciful, so interested, so involved, so paternal, so fatherly. One so perfect that he must permit you to worship and glorify him so that you receive the highest possible blessing. Do you see? To be his own child, he must make sure that you can be his own child in his presence, holy and completely blameless, worshipping and adoring perfection, because that is your highest good. That's the greatest blessing he could bestow on any creature. That's why he seeks his own glory. Your greatest good is that God is magnified in your life. This glorious one gives glory-infused grace to men to make that person a holy child, a holy adopted offspring of God, and not just any offspring, with the rights of the firstborn son to inherit everything. Thus, praise is automatic. It automatically rises and rushes out of the heart that has experienced it. This glory-infused grace is to demonstrate to creation and nature the extent of the glory of his person. This glory-infused grace is so that the entire universe can be seen to have been designed to give adoration and worship to God for this grace, this unspeakable gift of Christ. This epistle is so beautiful, Ephesians. It speaks much of this rich, full, glorious grace. God wants to show all creatures the inexhaustible boundlessness of his glory that is manifested by his grace, that is exhibited, displayed by his grace. I think Habakkuk summarizes it well in chapter 3, verse 3. His glory covered the heavens and his praise filled the earth. His splendor was like the sunrise. Rays flashed from his hand where his power was hidden. You see, you've got the glory covering the heavens. You've got his praise filling the earth. Glory and praise. You see, to the praise of the glory of his grace, God is magnificent. Worship him. Do you know what? If your heart is cold, if your heart is distant, if your heart is unmoved by these things, I fear for you. And I beseech you to cry out to God. He will come. He will. Any heart that cries out to God in truth, he will heed. Anyone who comes to me, I will in no wise turn away, Jesus said. Anyone who seeks the Lord with all their heart shall find. Anybody who knocks will find that the door is opened. So I beseech you, Open your heart, bow before him. I tell you, you've tried everything else. You've tried all your self delusion. You've tried all your self righteousness. You've tried all your works. You've tried everything except him. I tell you, he's wonderful. He's glorious. He's excellent. He's magnificent. He's merciful. He's full of grace. Bow before him. Humble yourself before him. You will find that your life will be filled with glory. You'll find your heart changed, enlivened. Maybe you've just left your first love. Well, come back right now. Come back to your first love. Exalt the glory. That's him. Exalt the glory of God, the one who is most glorious. Worship and adore him. Let's pray. Dear, glorious Heavenly Father, 
I ask that you would take these words. I ask that you would manifest yourself to us as you promised. I ask that you would make these words alive in hearts. I ask that you would have mercy, Lord, on cold and dead hearts. I ask that you would draw back those who've cooled off and turned away, Lord. I ask that you would show us again the riches of your glory. I ask that your convicting power would fall on hearts, each one of our hearts, Lord. For none of us is above another. We all stand at the feet of you, almighty God. We all bow at your feet. We are all just dust. We're all just clay before you. And I ask that you would again come and quicken hearts, enliven hearts, enlighten the eyes of hearts that they may see. For if the light that is in us is darkness, Lord, how great is that darkness. Give us spiritual eyes to see and understand who you are, what you've done, how great you are. We love you. We bow our hearts and our lives before you. We say, Lord, in the midst of all trials and sufferings, we see a tapestry of grace being woven. And we choose to take up our cross and follow you. For why wouldn't we? Why would we not follow such a glorious one who calls and beckons and patiently waits? Lord, I want my life to glorify you. Lord, I want my life to be to the praise of the glory of your grace. It's all about you. And I want to turn away from my selfishness. I want to turn away from my self-serving. I want to turn away from my wickedness. I want to turn to you. Come on, open your heart to him. Pray, seek him, worship him, love him. Repent if you must, repent, but do it swiftly. Do not sit in the presence of the Lord, idle, still, and defiant. He loves you. He is calling you. Yes, even you. He is calling you. Answer his call. This is a resource of Just Loving God.